Good evening. Welcome to The Fix Live with me, Aaron Mastani, Kirsty Major, and guess what? Our boy, Clive Lewis. How you doing? I'm all right. Hey, I think yeah. I'd shake your hand there, Matt. Hey, I am too. Whoa, 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 There you go. <laughs> um, we obviously have just come back from Labour Party conference last week. Today we'll be talking about Catalonia. We'll be talking about Tory party conference. But before we do, I think for our viewers who aren't yet acquainted with Clive, you have to see this video, it's a must watch. <laughs> all right, simmer down, simmer down. We all know she's the absolute girl. Round three. Round three, my friends. And the final one. We have Fixity Fortunes. It's like Family Fortunes, only it's got a terrible pun. Sure, let's repeat she this again. In there. Woo! Chug! <laughs> yes, chug, 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 chug. <laughs> That's awful. I can't believe you've done that to me. What happens the conference stays a conference. The conference the obviously the not. <laughs> I, hope, I hope your viewer appreciates what you just done. That was broad <laughs> <laughs> He brought the Saturn. Outrage! <laughs> Look, the, the conference blew. It's spread. Your lurgy's got to me. Look, we, we broadcast the whole thing live, you know, so there's not really much of a, an excuse. I thought you were great. It was a great. It was uh, brilliant. I had the best quiz. time. It was good. It was good. It was a good night. Really good night. The energy was fantastic. And I think I think I just got a little bit carried away with the the whole night, the whole week. That was towards the end of the week. So, and I hadn't drawn that much actually throughout the week. That was Tuesday, right? That was the night mm. before Jeremy's speech. That was the night before Jeremy's speech, and then conference ended. So that was just a kind of warm up. And Emily Thornbury was out in style that night, and then I saw her on the TV that morning. Looking, looking fresh <laughs> at yeah. Jeremy's speech. Emily, wow. Emily, <laughs> Emily can put to shame most of the younger intake of Labour MPs in terms of she's like a proper trooper. Yeah, yeah, Emily is. So before we carry on with um, Catalonia, Tories, a few quick thoughts. Start with you, Kirsten, then you, Clive. Mm. About Labour conference, because it's easy to be euphoric, optimistic. Yeah. Uh, this was a conference the likes of which we haven't really seen before. You know, normal people were getting excited about a Labour Party conference. What are your thoughts? I'm in the optimist camp. I think the amount of organisation and energy that went into it is something I haven't seen before. And it was like seeing all your mates who like kind of came to age during student protests all of a sudden being MPs, aides, putting on events. Like, and they're only going to get older and wiser and better. Um, uh, yeah, I think we're going to win in 2022. It was vibrant. It was young. It was networked. It was it it was it was everything I've I, I've always thought a conference could be. Um, and I have to admit, I spent 95 percent of my time at the fringes in the world transform. Most of it, the world transforms. Didn't really go into the. Um, I don't think MPs were allowed on the conference floor anyway. But I didn't go in. Didn't try and go in. But not because I didn't want to take part in the debates, but because I was booked up for so many different speaking engagements. And the energy there, it was just, it just kind of like a re renewal. And I think there was a sense of optimism, of hope. I think it has to be tempered with, outside of that bubble, the reality of, you know, an establishment and a Tory party and, and an elite who will do everything that they can to hold on to power. Uh, you know, look, you know, we've got a real potential for a left-wing Labour government here, and they ain't going to go quietly. So I think, you know, yet be confident, you know, bold, enthused but temper that with the reality of what we're up against and understand that and um, don't underestimate them. So, Great way to uh, move on to Tory Party Conference which started yesterday was it? Mm -hmm. mm. Although today was sort of the first big day we had Philip Hammond give a speech, Ruth Davidson, Theresa May gave a speech yesterday? Or well, she mentioned that these headlines around tuition fees were yesterday, rather, right? Yeah. I she think they've speaks... been floated before her right. May speech. Precisely, yeah, been sorry. Floated, yeah. She speaks tomorrow or? I mean, who knows, right? Nobody's there. No, well, <laughs> Matt Paris's, Matt, I, I kind of tweeted Matt Paris's former Tory MP, mm. who basically described them as the living dead mm. uh, and a conference of the kind of walking dead. Um, there, there is no life in them. And unless he was saying they have to basically decapitate um, the leadership and put someone else in that's capable, that's the only chance they've got. I think there are lots of people who are thinking about that at the moment. And I am struggling to see Theresa May survive until the next election, whenever that is. Obviously, Boris has been slapped down. And I think at the moment, the reason 
I think the thing keeping Theresa May in place is Jeremy Corbyn, and I will, I will, uh, I will explain that. I think because we are doing so well at the moment in the polls and as a party in terms of confidence, a united left, then I think that means that they don't want to take the chance of anything destabilising their government and calling into question the legitimacy of their, of their government. And I think, you know, it's, they, Theresa May has negotiated with the DUP. We don't have a government, we have a hostage crisis. She's held in, she's held in place by the DUP and the Brexit extremists in her party. Those are the people that are basically holding her hostage. And if she goes, what happens then? It could be quite destabilising. They do not want a general election because of where we are as a party. So I think they will stay in place for now. And obviously with uh, the election change that have taken place, it means that uh, there, is a, there are so few opportunities now. Just the Queen's speech, which they've <laughs> cancelled for next year. It's over two years, this one, um, to actually bring down the government. So. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty difficult to see how, unless they fall on their sword, um, we're going to call, can I see a general election. I can't see one before Brexit. Before Brexit. Or if there's good. an inordinate amount of by-elections, right, if all of a sudden, which was, that's, that's happened before, wasn't it? In the early 1990s, there was a flurry of by-elections. Yeah, that this, it's, it's possible. It's possible. Um, it is possible. It is possible. Yeah, that is possible. I mean, but I mean, you're waiting for people to drop. And as many could drop on our side uh, as their side, or scandals, which is also possible. Um, but yeah, that is one possibility. I think Clive is right. I think we do need to accept that we're in for the, the long run. I mean, Boris is rattling the cage, but he has been slapped down. Ruth Davidson, uh, Philip Hammond, and there was one other person. Michael Fallon. Michael Fallon, who went for him today. But he's rattling the cage. He wants in, he wants to go. He wants her out before 2019, and he'd like to... I mean, I think what he ideally wants is he wants, I think he kind of wants to be sacked and he wants to become like a backbench Brexit yeah. martyr. She wants to held in, keep your enemies close. That's it. Brexit goes really badly. You, backbench rebellion. You have to see Boris in the, in the context of, you know, this old Etonian and his protege, Cameron, is basically there going, <laughs> I've, been in, I've been in Downing Street, you haven't. And I think Boris sees this as his best chance now uh, with this destable, unstable, weak, leader, the knives are out. He wants to go for it. He doesn't seem to have the support. Mainly, I think, because although I think many people think Boris, in, in the Tory party, think Boris is great, they do not want the destabilisation that will cause because their biggest fear is A, an election, now, B, Jeremy Corbyn. And they're like, get back in your box. I don't want to know about this. So I think he's, you know, his timing is, is very poor. Um, and I think uh, but he sees this as his chance to kind of the glory for history, um, and it doesn't seem to be materialising for him just yet. Another potential successor to uh, Theresa May is, of course, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor. Uh, if we can cut to a video, I think we've got a video lined up. His speech today was appalling, and he couldn't help but talk about a crisis of capitalism. North, he called it North East, didn't he? He's in the North West, he's in Manchester. Oh. <laughs> he said here in the North East. It's all the same, it, it? was an appalling, <laughs> appalling speech, but once more he said we need to defend market capitalism because this isn't just a crisis for the British Conservative Party. The Tories have to keep on repeating it. It's a crisis of global capitalism itself. So let's cut to that speech very briefly because I don't want to send you to sleep. Listen to them and we must respond not by embarking on reckless experiments that would put at risk all the progress of the last decades, not by swimming against the tide of history, but by working with the market economy to deliver pragmatic solutions that will make ordinary lives across Britain better. Because conference, our economy is not broken. It is... It is broken. <laughs> it is broken. <laughs> it's bust. I'm going to quickly say why it's broken, OK? Product, uh, this is the camera. This is the, I keep on this the fucking McDonald's thing. Productivity, we now produce less in an hour of work than we did 10 years ago. Wages down, I'm going to repeat myself, ad infinitum. GDP uh, per head, not really going very far. We're now the poorest performing economy on GDP uh, of the G7. Okay. But he repeated something that Theresa May did last week at the Bank of England. They're now doing this thing where they don't just repeat the failed attack lines of the last general election against uh, Jeremy Corbyn. They're also saying, look, they could be, on the one hand, they're saying, we know that people are tired of the system, it's rigged. But then about a minute later, they say there's this consensus and we can't deviate from it. They've just got 43% in the general election. 
Why all of a sudden do they feel compelled to defend market capitalism itself, given that was the best performance for a Tory party since, I think, 87? What's going on? Are they listening too much to the media? Are they... Jeremy Corbyn setting the agenda to an extent I don't think any of us thought plausible even a few weeks ago. I think they know they have a long-term demograph demographic problem. Young people want... Not socialism, it's, it's not socialism what McDonald and Corbyn are proposing, it's social democracy. Mm. Um, and they know that that's what people want, and they're, they're just sort of like trying to like square the circle in their head. They're like, we need to give something to young people, but oh, we love the market, and uh, and I don't think they can square that. I think something has to give. And so what we didn't see in Hammond's speech is he proposed more funding for help to buy, and this is a really good example because help to buy doesn't help young people because it keeps house prices high, it keeps them inflated, um, it doesn't help with the supply, all it does is increase the demand. Um, Whereas what Corbyn's proposing is more housing, help with rent. Like, that actually appeals to young people. And then the other thing, of course, is tuition fees. Mm. They're just going to freeze it at a number that people don't like. Whereas Corbyn's like, you know what? Get rid of it. It's like, are you going to take Corbyn light proposals? Or are you going to take actual Corbyn? Um, what do you think, Clive? I think, well, on the tuition fees, 70% you know, of the 2016 intake of students will still be paying off um, you know, we'll have to have their debts written off. You know, it, it's it's ridiculous. Before they, as they know, when they retire, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's it, basically you're loading, uh, you're front loading the debt onto individuals. When you, and yet, as taxpayers, as engineers, doctors, nurses, they're making a massive contribution to our economy. If they're accountants, they're making a contribution to our society. I think, in terms of what that speech was about, you have to understand it's not just about what's happening in the UK. Global neoliberalism is in retreat, and the institutions that were set up, the IMF, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to basically enforce that are coming apart. And it's not because of Jer just because of Jeremy Corbyn or because of left populist movements, although they do play a small part. Actually, it's coming from their own sides. It kind of breaks into two camps. You've got now you've got the neoliberals like Trump, ultra neoliberals who want neoliberalism in one country. The hell with the global networks that we've built up over the last 40 years. It's America first, but we want a neoliberal America just for Americans and to hell with the rest of you. But then you've got people like Cameron, Osborne, Philip Hammond and others who are old school neoliberals who just think one more heave. Actually, it's that global order of the last 40 to 50 years, 35, 40 years that we want to protect and maintain. And they're hanging on by the fingernails. And they've been weakened, yes, by people like Corbyn and the resurgence of the left, but also by their own side, by powerful elites from their own countries who, for a variety of reasons, are now saying we don't want to play the way that we used to play. And that's what their problem is. They're not singing with a unified voice, which has always been the signature, though, of neoliberalism. Yes, there have been minor differences, but by and large, low tax, deregulation, undermined democratic institutions, financialization, they've all sung from the same sheet, and they've had those international institutions that have done that. That's now breaking apart, and that leaves an opportunity for the left, I think, to come in and blow wide open those cracks that are now appearing in that neoliberal monolith, which has for 40 years dominated politics and economics. But politically, don't you think it's count mm -hmm. the point of ideology is that it's invisible. It, it, it veils social relations to the extent where something is common sense rather than an imposition of economic forces. Mm -hmm. So for them to explicitly, sorry, I have actually got conference flu, so. <coughs> For them to explicitly say, we need to now defend markets, we need to defend uh, neoliberalism effectively, right? The, the settlement of the last several decades to the British public, it just seems odd to me. Politically, it seems a very, very immature, yeah. counterproductive, silly thing to do. This is a real... Well, you've, you've picked up on something there. That hegemonic power, real hegemonic power is transparent. It's common sense. And the first chink in that, really, I suppose, recently, was the whole austerity debate, which is now falling apart around the world, that there is no choice, there is no alternative, this is the only way. And actually, that now, by having to defend the forces which have been so transparent for so long, now means that it's out in the open. And if you saw the research that we were talking about just before we came on air, which was that, you know, there's been some quite substantial polling of public opinion in this country, and something like seven, high 70s, high mid 80% of the public across the age range now want to see, you know, water, energy, um, uh, what else? Water, energy, rail, renationalized, public, back into public ownership. Around about 50% of the population are saying that they would, we would consider seeing 
all banks put into public ownership, and that might be even a stage too far for, for John McDonald, I'm not sure, and 30% even saying take the airlines into public ownership, which clearly, after today's debacle with Monarch, with Monarch, could have gone up as well. So I think what you're seeing is people are beginning to say, this whole, this whole process, these free markets, haven't worked for us. They've worked for some, they've worked for the 1%, but they're not working for us. And so you need to, I'm afraid to say, you know, coming out with, well, maybe we can patch it up with this, or maybe we can give you students a little bit of that and freeze this here and do that there. I think people want something bigger and deeper and more profound in terms of change in politics. The Labour Party, thank God, is now offering that. And it's in a position to make those offers in the next couple of months and weeks and years. And obviously the 20 17 manifesto was a start of that. But we can now begin to build on that and begin to make an offer to people where people say, this makes sense. I think the tide's turning. And I think that transparency of common sense is beginning to fall apart. And the time, I think, not to be complacent, but to say we've got a real opportunity here to shift the political center ground. It is shifting, but to shift it fundamentally for some time to come and to build on that. And that's what's so exciting. We're so excited about our conference and what's so exciting about politics at the moment. I can see it in the chamber. The Tories are scared. Now, be careful what you do, because when you put a Tory party scared in the corner, they're going to get desperate. And I think we have to be prepared for that. Nonetheless, I do think we've got them on the run, and we just have to keep them on the run, but not trip over our own feet while we're doing it. That's really important. OK, well, I've got some questions to ask both of you. <clears throat> How far do we take nationalisation? So let's start with Greg's. Na nationalised all pasties. Nationalised, Greg's? Fully automated luxury Cornish pasties. <laughs> <laughs> Clive, no, nationalised, no, Greg's? Do you know what? They're, 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 look, I, this is the thing. You know, people say, you know, I've had people on Twitter, they say, no, capitalism's great. But no one expects John McDonald and Jeremy Corbyn at the, at, on day one of a Labour government to, to abolish capitalism and to abolish markets and to abolish shops and currency, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's, that's not going to... Greg's can stay, I think. I think... <laughs> But I think, you know what I would like to see? I'd like to see far more workplace democracy uh, for its workers. So Greg's could become a, a, work, a, a sort of worker-owned cooperative, potentially. Why not? OK, next, Weatherspoons. Weatherspoons. Oh, well, Brexit support on Weatherspoons. <laughs> I mean, we should make our own version of Weatherspoons, get rid of Weatherspoons full stop, because, you know... Hmm. Uh, we need to make our own people's weather spoons. Potentially controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Nationalised weather spoons? Do they do register it? That's the question here. Oh. <laughs> Minister, no, my... <laughs> Minister for weather spoons. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, you know what? I'm going to get down there. I'm not going to get down that path. So, so, yeah. uh, do I think they should be... Um, no, again, you know, look, there are certain things, the kind of the, the, the heights of the economy, there are certain elements of the economy which I think are, let's not get ahead of ourselves, so what's, which, okay, are natural, so which are naturally, it, which are natural, which are make natural, you can make natural arguments for them to be publicly owned. For things that tend to monopoly, for instance, right? Yes. Like water and, and things energy. which people, yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, I also think, you know, information. You know, this is the, this is part, of, yeah, this is, this is, this is something thing. which is, which, you know, neoliberalism kind of modern capitalism is trying to suppress. Not, you know, markets are based on scarcity, on finite resources. Knowledge is infinite. And there's a contradiction there. And what we're seeing with Google and Facebook and others is that they're trying to monopolize, that the reaction of capitalism is to, is to try to monopolize an infinite supply, an infinite resource. Uh, and that's not working. I mean, you know, and I think, that's, I think that is, this is, this is really, really important, really interesting area where I think, you know, you saw the world transformed, you've seen momentum and how they've worked with technology and how they've spread ideas through that technology. You know, you look at the, 20, you look at the 2011 um, uprisings that took place across the, you know, the Arab Spring and so on. These were also interconnected, globally interconnected people using technology to kind of spread ideas and information. So I think, you know, that's the, one of the areas that we as socialists have to look at is what will be the different, what will be the, what will be the components of the economy in the 21st century that we have to democratize and have to ensure that they're not captured. Uh, solely by large corporations and the elites, and I think that's something that we need to do a lot of thinking about. Yeah, I totally agree. I think Uber was, I mean, a really small microcosm of this. Really, like TfL in London should have been able to step in straight away when Uber was clamped down on with London's own version, a TfL version of Uber, because right now Uber has all of the data on the journeys that are made in London. Mm. They know more about London than, than TfL do. 
and that's dangerous, right? If private enterprise is no more than the city, than the state. So what would these 40,000 workers who are being laid off now, effectively, the if the licence isn't renewed, which it may be renewed, but if it isn't renewed, 40,000 people lose their means of earning a living. What should the government do in regard to them and Uber more generally? I mean, that's the question, right? You're the Minister for Transport. Clive's at Weatherspoons. <laughs> you're, at, you're at the Department of Transport. So this is where I think Corbyn touched upon this in the speech, and I actually thought it was the most radical part of Corbyn's speech, which was talking about what we do in an, an automated future and what you do about jobs. And it's about providing not welfare, but like a basic income for people who start to lose their jobs because of automation or changes to regulation in the case of Uber mm. and what you do to retrain people. So Singapore has a really great model um, for doing this. Denmark mm. has a really great model. We're really crap at it because all we do is think about educating young people, but actually there's going to be vast ways for people who need to start re-entering re re the education system. And we're just not prepped for it. We're not yeah. even thinking about it. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like just kind of fumbling around here, but I kind of think if you have open source data and software, which anyone can utilize, you would have, if Transport of London put the infrastructure down, if they actually put down, you know, these are the conditions upon which you, and these are the licensing conditions which you must, which Uber hasn't been operating mm. by, and which you must operate by. Mm. And then you can have, you'll have kind of cooperatives setting up, using open source data, being able to share that data, make it free. That to me would work far better than allowing you know, monopoly a monopoly like you, Uber, to control. Um, and as we all know, there's been issues about price fixing and about what's been going on, about how Uber operate. So, you know, look, there's an opportunity here. We don't just have to see it as 40,000 people being put onto the, you know, the scrap heap. This is the technology that isn't going away. You can't put this back in the box. But what we can do is, as a government, and what government should be doing, is setting down the rules to A, make it fair, a level playing field and safe, make sure that people are paying their taxes, etc., but also open it up. Uh, allow people who actually, you know, to have access to the data to be able to it's put forth their data, own software. Right? And that's, I think that's the thing that we forget. Like, it's our data. It's our, it's data. our journey. Like, it's almost this weird Faustian deal you enter into where you're like, oh, you can have every single element of my soul if I can just have a cheap yeah. ride. Yeah. And it's like, no, that's, that's mine. Like, you know, I yeah, should get right. a bit of a benefit from that's it. Right. Democratise it, you know, make it, you know, accountable, transparent. You know, these are the, it's those same rules that go through everything. Accountability, transparency, open. Um, and that kind of, I think, you know, what can you do to prevent those cartels, those monopolies from dominating, especially in those new technologies? And I think, you know, there is a, there is a future for apps like that in this city. Of course there are, but they just have to play by the rules. And I think it has to be done in a, uh, with the principles and values of 21st century socialism. Right. Before we continue, talk about Catalonia, we're now going to cut to the inspirational, the breathtaking speech mm -hmm. of the Prime Minister given at the Bank of England last week. Again, try not to fall asleep because it really is something else. Let's see what Therese has got to say. We should never forget the immense value and potential of an open, innovative, free market economy which operates with the right rules and regulations. When countries make the transition from closed, restricted, centrally planned economies to open free market policies, the same things happen. Life expectancy increases and infant mortality fails, falls. Absolute poverty shrinks and disposable income grows. Access to education is widened and rates of illiteracy plummet. Participation in cultural life is extended and more people have the chance to contribute. It is in open free market economies that technological breakthroughs are made which transform, improve and save lives. It is in open free market economies that personal freedoms and liberties find their surest protection. A free market economy operating under the right rules and regulations is the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. Clear. Are you alive? Clear. We actually had to in inject some in in adrenaline into Clive. <laughs> Kirsty was smearing, you know, <laughs> oh, phantom yeah. of my teeth. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty bad, wasn't it? Um, uh, look, I mean, she's the prime minister of a major global economy. Well, she's talking to bankers, and she's but, mean, it's, but it's, I mean, yeah, something's going really. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about Catalonia. There's a potential, not revolution, but there may be a unilateral declaration of independence in Catalonia. Mm. We have a British prime minister saying we need to defend capitalism. 
this does, this is not a cliche anymore. It's beginning no, to feel like the 1930s. It's, 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 Trump is a big part of it. I mean, I've said that before, yeah. but there's something is breaking down. And, you know, you've, Brexit is, is a part of it. Uh, there's a breakdown in the, in the kind of the, the cosy order that was there. You know, the neoliberals in Europe, the neoliberals in European capitals and the neoliberals in, in London, they're not, they're not happy with each other because this is, and Trump, it's all breaking apart. And this is a reflection of that. She's trying to shore up you know, the bastion of global capitalism, London, the financial centre. And they're not happy about what's happening because they see it weakening. They're looking over at Corbyn. I was meeting with the Financial Conduct Authority. I said to them, I mean, I remember saying to them, if you don't get banks in order, you're going to have John McDonnell coming in, potentially. Yeah. yeah? How do you think your boys in the bank... In the, in the ba and the face, this is about three weeks ago. Their right. faces dropped. They were like... <laughs> like they hadn't thought of it. And it's like, I can see... There's this image of John McDonnell coming in and like... Oh my God, we never thought of this. And it's like they should be thinking about it because it's a reality. Start cleaning your house up, get your act together. I think, look, I think we can get carried away here. I think we have to understand is that, you know, this, these people, these institutions, these organizations, not only are they extremely wealthy and extremely clever, they're survivors, you know? And, and I'm afraid to say, you know, the history shows that the left has a, a fantastic capacity for kind of tripping over its own feet. Now, I don't think that's gonna happen this time, but, what I must say is we must be cautious. We mustn't over-egg the fact of what's going on. It is happening. It is a reality. But we've got to think very carefully about what we do and how we do it and how we, how we maximise the possibilities and the potential that these cracks in their system, which are now glaring. And I think that's something which I think so far, John, Jeremy and the leadership have really done really well. They've managed to navigate this and turn it to, you know, put us into a position where we're in a really strong position. We want to stay in that strong position, but we can't guarantee that they're going to continually trip over their own feet. At some point, they're going to sense a danger. I think they're sensing it now, and they're going to start club clubbing together. That's when it becomes more difficult for us. But one thing I do know is that the last two years have battle-hardened the left <laughs> in this country. It's been a tough two years for us, especially in the party. But I think if we can you know, get to where we've got to now, we know there's, there is a, there's a real opportunity here. I don't think we're going to mess it up. Okay, so you're at the Indy. Is there a, is there a sort of changed sense of possibility in the last several months? Is it really coming home now to people that John McDonnell could be telling, you know, the various regulators what's, what's what? Wall Street. <laughs> um, I feel like you can, you can split it, you can split the newsroom in half and it's between young people working in newsrooms and older people. Older people don't don't agree with the Corbyn project. It doesn't appeal to them. They just don't understand. Like, so this was another journalist who I not at the Indy, um, but another ref, ref, reputable paper. Who, as I was going into the World Transform Conference, and there was a queue outside you know, for Corbyn speaking, he was like, "I just, I mean, I like politics. That's why I do what I do, but I don't get it." And I was like, "Ah, oh, it's because you're older. You've got a house." You know, like none none of the things which have affected the rest of us or the rest of us young people have affected you. Um, but return to what was Cl Clive was saying about the economy. I think we need to like take a few steps back, right? And I think when we talk about the economy, we tell stories, right? And this is something that George Monbiot has been writing about a lot recently, and I'm really into the idea. You know, you tell stories, and what older people are saying is they're saying the 70s was awful, it didn't work, mm. it messed up, and then you have younger people saying neoliberalism messed up, I saw the banking crisis, mm. I saw the banks being bailed out, I can't buy a house. So you've got these two competing stories and in many ways they're really old stories. Social democracy is a well-worn tale, so is neoliberalism. But actually maybe what I think part of the longer term project is coming up with a new story, like yet yeah, neither of these things work but we've got this new thing to offer you. Because mm. then you can't knock it, right? In the mm. way you can knock neoliberalism or you can knock social democracy. Yeah, we own it. You know? um, we own it. I've been talking about that, which is a kind of a kind of group that's been talking up public ownership for quite some time, and they were saying, you know, look, it's the values and principles of social democracy. Not we, no one's talking about bringing back British Rail and soggy egg sandwiches. You know, that's not on the agenda. I I was egg <laughs> fried egg sandwiches. That's not on the agenda. You know, it is possible in the 21st century to create something with those values and principles, you know, in terms of accountability, in terms of uh, cooperation, democracy, into public ownership with those, with that investment of what we pay to go on those trains, reinvested back into subsidized travel and into, you know, new and up-to-date technology. They can do it in Europe. We can do it in the UK. We are so far behind Europe 
in terms of what we allow in parts of Europe, in terms of what we allow, what, what's publicly owned, what's not, how the economy works, basic democracy, trade union rights. You know, that's what's unified the left at the moment. It's that we are so far on the back foot compared to the rest of the, the civilised world in European countries in terms of, you know, I say the civilised world, I mean developing world as well, in terms of those rights, those basic rights. That's why so many people, you can build that coalition of people. It becomes more difficult the further on you get down, but that's... Well, this is happening, right? I don't think most Brits know this, but China, China has 15,000 miles of high-speed rail. 15,000 miles, right? And we're talking about HS2. Now, I know it's a very wealthy country, but on a GDP per head basis, yeah. it's a very poor country. Yeah. So something And it's also geographically very big. We're quite a small island. So, yeah, I think something strange is happening. And you've got more high-speed rail in places like Britain, China, and eventually many countries in the global south, far more than here. And, yeah, we have a model that's not working. The thing that's not... The thing that isn't... <clears throat> which is a bit, which is, it's mm. southern, southern Rail, which is why so many people were late to the first day of the world transformed. It's a catastrophe. The right-wing conspiracy. Well, the, 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 the carriages they use... Are for, well, the, the trains they use primarily are still intercity 125s, and they were developed in the early 1970s. So we're, you know, we're using these carriages from, you know, 45 years ago. Unbelievable. Yeah, I think the other thing that we have in the kind of the elephant in the room, well, no, there's two elephants in the room, there's Brexit, but we don't go there. We'll have a conversation about talking about Brexit. Um, but the other elephant in the room is, <clears throat> is climate change, the nine planetary boundaries, resource depletion. This is another reason, you know, I couldn't think of what, you can't think of a worse economic system of avarice, of greed, of inequality um, to be in place at a time when the world is burning. You know, so that that free market approach that, that you know that has dominated for the last forty years is the worst possible combination of ideas and values you could have when you're trying to tackle you know population biodiversity, uh, climate change, the issues which are which which increasingly you know if you listen to scientists they're saying by you know what scientists and economists are saying if we still have the neoliberal order you can kiss goodbye after 2050. They'll, you know, it, we will go into hell in a handcart in terms of population shifts, in terms of you know, natural catastrophes, in terms of uh, unchecked warming, you know, global warming. You know, we have got a limited time frame to get this you know, sussed and to kind of get these guys out of the way and to bring in you know, a new order, a new way of doing things. It, and this is my big issue, and it is a little bit linked to Brexit. It can't be socialism in one country. We have got to, re we have got to rekindle internationalism. You know, we have got to link up with the SPD, who are now on the opposition benches, who are saying <laughs> to me, we need to, we need to look at what you're doing to see what we need to do, because we lost a lot of our core support, working class vote, to the AFD, the fascists. So how are we? You know, they bought into the whole kind of Merkel neoliberal project. It's a kind of slightly different neoliberalism to ours, but nonetheless it is. They now want... So, you know, we need to be linking up with these people to make sure that we understand that we can't do this on our own. We're going to have to link up with global movements around the world we're going to have to make sure the dots connect up because there's no point having fantastic NHS, fantastic high-speed rail in this country when the rest of the world is going to head in a handcart. And that's, that's the big challenge. There are people around the world that are looking at what Corbyn has done or what the left has done in this country and are inspired by it, and we need to build on that. Would that internationalism have to bypass existing global institutions? That's the big question, such as the EU. I mean, that was the case around Lexit, right? It was like you should be able to organise grassroots and social democratic projects between borders without the EU, which is essentially a neoliberal monolith. In no, it's sense. not. <laughs> but, but I, know, I know, but that was the Lexit. Yeah, case. that was I the Lexit argument. Yeah. There's nuances between that. But I just wanted to raise one really quick thing, which Clive brought up, which is the environmental question, because I think actually this is a question that the left is not asking itself because the social democratic model of growth, the Keynesian model, yes. doesn't deal with climate change. It's based on an economy which has two moving parts, the state uh, you know, and the market, and it's based on growth, and that growth is often based on production and how we produce yeah. creates climate. But this, con this conference know? was okay. I mean, it was, this was a much, much more Jeremy, alive to climate. Term, I picked up on it because my, my claxons go off. He didn't use growth. He used sustainable growth. Yeah. Now, there are, some, there are some in the ecological and environmental movement who go, eh, you can't, it's a contradiction. You know, it's a, it's a contradiction in terms. Um, however... I think, you know, there are some really interesting theories out there. There's something called the donut theory, um, yeah, which, is, is, really, which is, this is what you're talking about, about, about flows yeah. of resources linked to carbon and so on, which has been a lot of thought has gone into. It's, it's kind of been described as Keynes for the 21st century, taking into account planetary boundaries, mm -hmm. the ecology, and how we, you know, how we could have an economy that works for everyone, not just the rich white West, 
but the rest of the, the rest of west of the world. Did I sound like yeah. I'm a fud there? The rest of the world, but taking into account resources and population. And you know, this is cool. You know, look it up. Go online. The donut theory. Really interesting. It's been done by Oxford University. A, a, a female, a woman professor there, academic, um, who designed this. And uh, George Monbiot has written about it. And I don't understand the intricate details of it. You know, I know a little bit more about Keynes because I did a degree in economics at university. So I understand about aggregate demand and so on. On this, I'm not so I'm not so clued up, but it's something I'm going to be looking at. And I think these are the kind of radical ideas that you know 21st century social democracy needs to be looking at. And this is what's so exciting. And these were the kind of things that were coming up at the World Transformed. And that's what made it so inspiring, so brilliant for someone like me who feels that we've been trapped in a kind of, you know, time loop of a neoliberal time loop. to the Tory conference, it's like, where's your fringe events with these like radical new ideas? Like, what are you pushing for? What is the one I retweeted? Um, uh, it was, it was, it was, um, Brexit will offer fantastic new deals for vaping deregulation. No. Yeah. <laughs> vaping for dads. I mean, it was, and it had all these like kind of four crusty men on there about to come and talk about the opportunities Brexit would would release for you know vaping deregulation. That's that. That's the high watermark of Conservative Party thinking. You know what? Good. Let them crack on with it. Let them vape to their hearts' content. <laughs> I see. You know, happy days. But right. you know, that's what we're up against. Vaping, huh? This is, mind you, vaping is kind of cool. That's the thing that was the Hillary. Do you remember the Hillary vaping meme? Do you remember this? No. Oh god, we'll leave that to one side. <laughs> it's a centrist ad thing, isn't it? Right, yeah. centrist ad thing. <laughs> Uh, speaking of internationalism beyond the institutions of the existing global order, uh, there's been a significant amount of solidarity, it's fair to say, from including Jeremy Corbyn, uh, from the left towards those in Catalonia over the last couple of days. Yesterday there was a referendum in Catalonia in regard to independence. It won't be legally binding, in fact it's illegal, yet millions participated, around 2 million people voted yes to independence. Turnout of around 40%. In terms of the actual numbers, we're not sure, but it could be... Uh, I think 700,000 was the number in terms of stolen ballots. So it's up on the last uh, independence referendum in 2015, which was also not legally binding. Clive, Paul Mason wrote a piece in The Guardian. We had a, we had a great conversation yesterday. Check that out on the face, Facebook page. He wrote a piece in The Guardian saying that this movement for Catalan independence is an extension of uh, a global order in collapse yeah. and a grassroots desire for social justice yeah. and a break with neoliberalism rather than vanilla nationalism. Do you accept think, that argument? Yeah, and I think there were, there, were, there were definitely overtones of that in the Scottish referendum. You know, it, was a radical, it was a radical independence vote, which was only narrowly defeated by the fact that you know, corporations basically clubbed together to say, we're leaving your country, which, you know, which enabled the older vote to kind of say, oh, my mortgage. You know, and I, you, know, you can understand that. You know? So I think, yes, I think he has a point. I think it is linked into that. I think what it raises, I mean, the violence aside, which has been appalling, um, it, it, it does raise into question the legitimacy of states and how they hold themselves together. What, what is it based on? What is the legitimacy of a state, of the entity of Spain, as it currently is formatted? What is that? What is it based on? I mean, I'm sure lots of people, lots of lawyers will come out and you know, can be waving documents saying it's based on this settlement and this and, the, and the, this constitution. But the you know, democratic legitimacy <laughs> requires the consent of people. And in Catalan, the Spanish government clearly, it looks like, doesn't have that consent to rule as, as, a, as, the Spanish, as a Spanish entity. So um, I think, you know, look, I think Paul's probably right. I think there are links with this into kind of the global order breaking down, the, glo the accepted global order of what you can and what you can't do. Um, do states have a right to exist? Well, people have a right to exist. I'm not sure whether states do. Does the Spanish state have you know, a God-given right to exist as it is? Well, there was a question that came up during the referendum debate in, you know, between in the United Kingdom and Scotland wanted to break away. People say, well, we're the United Kingdom. We exist. We are. Well, they were saying, but we have a right to break away. We have a right to break up the United Kingdom through our own self-determination. That's what the Catalan people are trying to do. And I have to say, my, my, my sympathies are with them. I understand it's a very complicated situation, um, but, you know, there, there is, there is, a, there is, a, there does feel to be a democratic legitimacy there. They want, they want to be able to break away from what is, in effect, Spain is an in integral part of that neoliberal order. Um, and I mean, I think it might be a little bit too early to say that this is some kind of radical breakaway movement. It's quite possible that if they did happen to break away, they would, you know, very, very quickly you know, do nothing, little more than just establish a kind of Catalan version of 
of neoliberalism and, and join into the, you know, the kind of whatever the world order was at the time. That's the most likely outcome. I might be wrong. I'm not an expert in Catalan politics, but I definitely think the upsurge in public support for this is definitely linked to wider social movements that Paul's uh, identified. And in many ways it's analogous to Brexit, which is, which is quite worrying in the sense that austerity led people to want mm. to vote for a nationalist party um, and to vote for independence to, to, to break away. And the party which has been dominating the debate in Spain is Supercat and their centre-right. So you're on the one side, you've got a centre-right party, Supercat, and the other side in Spain, you've got CP, who are right-wing. So the two parties dominating the narrative, like, like with Brexit, it's the right-wing parties. Um, so even though you have a, you know, a vein of resistance underneath the way you did with Lexit and the way you do with Spain, with uh, Podemos, um, they don't dominate the narrative. They're there, their voice is being heard, but they're not the loudest voice, and that's kind of the worrying thing about it. But I think, like Clive said, this throws up really big questions about what the state is. Mm. And the state is a social contract, right? Yeah. You agree to be, uh, you agree to form the state, you agree, agree to pay taxes, you agree to be policed by consent. Sense. But what we're seeing, I mean, this is what really got me about it. That's not consent. It's not, it's not, that's not consent. That's no. the police enacting political will. That's the police being the arm of violence of the state. And that worries me so deeply because it's like you forget about it and i know we have this a cab it's, it's, it it's transparent it's transparent and then yeah if um if the if the guy the production guys next door can get up some videos of various scenes of violence that may be helpful for viewers who aren't familiar with this yeah here we go um they're good yeah one of the one of the one of the videos we put up yesterday was actually from 2014 2015 that's watermarks with live leaks and, and these are fire these are firefighters yesterday, yeah. you know these are people that work together normally i mean i assume i mean i guess they've shipped these people in from spain because i yeah, imagine the yeah. the catalan police aren't playing ball this is, it. This is the guardia civil and they they um yeah. they uh i mean they do public order policing etc a bit like the tsg but they're a fair bit bigger territorial support group in this country let's not forget you and know thugs, spain basically. was a, spain was a fascist state yeah. 40 years ago, within living, you know, memory. within living memory, 40 years ago, when I was born, um, I'm giving my age away there, but when I was born, Spain was a fascist state. My nan and granddad brought back a coin from their first holiday with Franco's head on it. Yeah. That one is, that, that scene is that unreal. You just, on yeah, it's oh unbelievable. God. If we can rewind that a sec, maybe not, I don't know, we probably can't, right? But, you know, basically the defenders of this stuff, including Boris Johnson, Michael Fallon, they're saying, well, there's a constitution, there's a rule of law, you're not upholding the rule of law when but, you but drop you, kick yeah. somebody who's sitting on a bloody stairwell. But this is the this is the issue. The rule of law, as it, as has become increasingly understood by lots, of, especially the developing world, the rule of law is flexible when 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 you have might on your side. And you know this is this is one of the things that we see with the neoliberal model is this that this obsession with the rule of law because without the rule of law, uh, you can't extract. These off, you know, these these excessive profits. You can't control society. You can't control the economy without the so-called rule of law. So it does require consent, and it does require people to kind of accept what's happening. And increasingly, people are saying no. Um, and the problem is, we understand now that the rule of law is fixed. It's why these in investor state dispute settlement process, these so-called international trade kangaroo courts, that was at the heart of TTIP. This is about having the rule of corporate law uh, agreed in dark rooms between, two, you know, between different corporate lawyers about how they will control um, the na nation's democratically elected nation states. That's what it's about. So the rule of law is very important to neoliberalism, but it's also very flexible for them as well when they want it to. That's why there's such a song and dance is made when George Bush or Tony Blair or others don't seem to play by the so-called rule of law. It's what Vladimir Putin, who is a brutal dictator in my opinion you know he's, he's 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 not someone to look up to but he often he often he makes the point that the west has a rule of law when it suits them and when it doesn't they do what they want what they need to do so you know i think what we need to understand here in in what's happening in catalan and when the tories talk about the rule of law what they're on about is basically the global order is cracking we don't like it Let's all stick to what we know. And I think that's, what you, that's the feeling you're getting from the speech at the Bank of England. That's what you're getting with what's happening in Catalan. That's what's part of the kind of Jeremy Corbyn movement. Things are beginning to fall apart, and they can sense it. 
The rule of law. I mean, for me, it seems it's just the kind of, you know, it's about guaranteeing property relations. Auto liberalism is a, is a way of understanding this. There's a guy called Werner, excuse me, I'm so sick. Werner, it'll come to me. Google it, Libcom Werner. German uh, theorists who came up with the idea of order liberalism. They say, we don't want the state, we want the guaranteeing of contract, we want strong courts, strong police, precisely because yeah. it's, it's a been... German model. That's what I know Paul Mason. Order so liberalism. The Germans yeah. have order liber yeah, yeah. liberalism. And then the first, the, it's the kind of, it's the antecedent to neoliberalism. And uh, it's about, yes, uh, having a strong state against the weak and a weak state against the strong. Mm. Um, but yeah, is that correct? Or are we being unfair? Are we being, you know, Cantankerous leftists. No, not at all. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know how anyone can watch those scenes and not feel afraid of the state and the power that the state wields when it doesn't, when it, when it suits them. I, you know, I can sit here. We just say all grieve. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you can think of, you know, student protests. You can think of a number of situations throughout our history where um, the state. Neoliberalism in the last 40 years has used violence to maintain the, the, the status quo to the, the, the uh, what's the what's the term where the expression we're using the, um, the rule of law rule of law. I've yeah. got a question for you, though. If um, there's a unilateral declaration of independence by the Catalan government in the next several days, which is entirely plausible and they're arrested, what separates Rajoy from Erdogan? And then by extension of that question, why is Spain in the EU but Turkey isn't? Well, obviously... And would Spain be kicked out of the EU? I mean, no, it won't be, right? No, but what does that say the about... The Eurozone relies on Spain. Yeah, so what does that say about... Catalan is so dangerous. So what does that say about European democracy? And by extension, what does that say about EU values? Mm. I think... So I think if that happened, Spain would be in a world of pain. Because that, if they arrest the Catalan if they government. arrest the Catalan government, because that's clearly not going. All they're going to do is is is, is dampen down the fires. They're not going to put them out. And I think the only way this is going to be resolved is through a, you know a democratic settlement. It's not going to be resolved through repression. If anything, it's going to radicalise yet more people. So I, I think Spain probably feels like it's got its back against the wall that it has to do this. I think whoever made this decision has made a, has made a tragic mistake. I, I, look, I, I I think that. It, whatever the situation in Catalan is in terms of the federal deal that's on offer, it clearly isn't enough. It wasn't enough for Scotland. You know, that, that, ultimately it was, but up in the run-up to the referendum campaign, it wasn't. But I think in terms of whether this would put Spain on a par with Erdogan, Erdogan's, I think, in a different category. I think in terms of what he's up to and what he's doing, in terms of uh, how he's undermining the rule of law, the extra powers he's given himself and, or been given through the uh, plebiscite that he had recently. I think he's of a different order of magnitude in terms of despotism uh, to Spain. But I think Spain is definitely on rocky ground, and it's going to be ground which increasingly will be challenged. It would be nice to see other European countries, socially progressive European countries, and they do exist, Scandinavian countries, for example, challenge this. But I think you know that's what you often see in Europe, is they provide, they provide a united front. Um, bolster and support successionist movements because you've probably got your own at home. If you're Sweden, you've got the Sami people in the north, That's indigenous right. people who want their own territory. If you're in the UK, you've got the Scots. Who, and the Welsh. And the Welsh. And the Scousers and the Cornish. And the Irish. And the you know, all is the a, but this is the thing, you know, states, you know, that we, we, I think, you know, you look back at history, it is about constant change. And it's about managing that change and about trying to, you know, trying to learn from history about how can we manage, how can we avoid the bloodshed of the past? How can we how can we manage this in a, in a way that actually ha leads to an outcome which benefits all and you know takes out the immediacy of a, of a crisis and this obviously has has failed dramatically but states don't have a right to exist for it for, for, for you know it, 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 you know it, it, indefinitely you know they do change they do merge peoples change this is inevitable this is an inevitability of history we see that and you know clearly Spain is going through a, a period where there, is a, there are millions of people that no longer want to be, be part of the Spanish collective. They want separation from that. So it's a complete nightmare for Spain. Um, and the way that they're dealing with this, I think, is completely wrong. Speaking of law, um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right to self-determination is there. So 
right? You know, this is up for grabs in terms of but it's what. The UN Declaration of Human yeah. Rights is under UN and international organisations. But these are the internet. These are the sort of the norms par excellence of international law, yeah. right? If this is a country in the global south, if it's South Sudan, we say, look, they have the right to self-determination. Well, you know, you, you, then you then you go to the Palestinian Declaration of of, of, of statehood that was done recently in the United Nations. Um, you know, there is an element of to be able to look, the way that nation states or Entered state entities often, you know, are, are created is through violence. Through look at the United Kingdom, look at the history of it, Cromwell and and so on and so forth. The, 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 the you know the the wars which kind of brought Scotland and Wales into into the United Kingdom. They're they're created by by violence, and they're often held in place by violence. Look at Northern Ireland. You know, you look on both sides. You know, the violence that's been committed by. Both sides of, of that, that's the, the UK, the British government, and the Irish. It's almost as no, if it's, the state it's... has a monopoly on legitimate violence. Well, you, yes, I know. It's almost as if it but does, isn't it? You're a, you're, a, you're, a, you're a politician. Yeah. So and how, how, we, how, 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 how do you, it, it's very, you know... Well, I'll tell you... I'll tell you I, how do you reconcile a, a, a dem, that? But a, a, dem, a genuinely democratic state does. And yes, I suppose, I believe it has that right. Um, to maintain law and order, that sound, I sound more like a Tory now, don't I? Saying that, but what I don't believe is that you can you can basically sell uh, that ability to G4S, which is apparently something that's potentially been or or private institutions. Now in America, the right to uh, administer violence, if you want to put it that way, has been outsourced to. If you think about the private companies, the private organisations which run. The, the, the most violent institutions in the United States, the prisons. Um, it has. I have an issue with that. Making, outsourcing violence for profit doesn't really kind of float my boat. So, you know, look, I think it's something we do need to be aware of. But you know, ultimately, you know, our history is based on empire, on colonization, on wars of dominance of our neighbors. That's been based on violence. It's been done by the state. And sometimes it's been a monarchy. Sometimes it's been an oligarchy. Sometimes it's been... Uh, something less than uh, less than perfect democracy. Do I think we have a perfect democracy now? No, I don't. But I think if we actually, as social democrats, can strive for the best possible democracy we can have, then we also have to say we have a right to defend that democracy from those who would take it from us. And that means enabling the state to to use violence. You, I mean, do we think in a perfect democracy we're going to suddenly say, well, you know, there is no crime? Um, no, we don't. So therefore you know, taking a criminal, capturing them and putting them in prison is, imprisoning someone is an act of violence of sorts. It really is. So are we going to say we don't have that right? No, we're not. Now, if you believe that you shouldn't, then I guess that probably puts you into the category of anarchist, I would have thought. Well, it's that the idea from Thomas Paine that government's a necessary evil, but it's about entering into a contract with people. And it's the idea of accountability, like that contract should be up for negotiation. Yeah all the time, which is the idea of the constitution with, with Spain, like Catalan is illegal under that constitution. Why shouldn't constitutions be up for debate, you know, every four years? Yeah. Like, you can't just, like, I mean, look, to, to move the news on a little bit, look at what happened in America today. Like, the right to bear arms is in their constitution, but it is fundamentally yeah. just pulling that state apart. Like, nearly 60 people yeah, died their today. History, I mean, yeah, you know, you know, you know, Native American Indians as oppression of slavery, um, colonization of the West. I mean, this is a, a country that was built on, you know, all states are built on violence, but this was built on violence in a very, very in, in, in relative terms, very recent history. And on top of that, the right to bear arms means that you now, you have a country which, you know, I think actually more people are killed domestically in the US than in all the wars they fought. <laughs> Elsewhere, I think so, every you know, year or something. It's, no, it's, it's, since, it's, since it's, Vietnam, it's a, I don't know. It's an it's an awful figure. Yeah, well, there's it's every an year awful more figure. people die from firearms raids and stuff in really Vietnam. That's an interesting conversation, right? Because on the one hand, was the saying the state has monopoly on violence. This is terrible. But then you look at sort of devolved ability to, right bear, to bear arms. arms. Well, for, for Hobbes, to be a, like the you know the, the healthy in between. For Hobbes, America would be a, a you know it'd be a state of nature. It's a war of all against all. Because you know, peaceability. Nasty. Yeah, yeah, peaceability yeah. isn't the uh, the virtue par excellence. You don't have, uh, you know, privatization, so to speak, of violence, but within uh, the, the the body or the office of the monarch, i.e., the state, the sovereign. So yeah, I think very quickly we're going to finish up. You brought in the U.S. I'll ask you both. 
there's been a growth of militias in the US uh, since the crisis in the last 10 years, almost analogous, I guess, to uh, an increased desire for independence in places like Scotland and in uh, Catalonia. Are there big problems ahead for the US state? Do you think? Uh, it, there seems to be an arms race going on. I mean, I, I read a little bit about this. I've read a little bit about this. I mean, the, the, one of the big concerns for um, Democrats, socialists, I don't mean Democrats with a capital D, but I mean kind of uh, civil rights groups and so on, is the militarization of the police and the effect that is having on policing. But if you go to the kind of one of the core roots of the, the root sources of this, it is an innate fear of the far right militias who, if you speak to the police, this, this it, it's, not, it's not actual jihadi terrorists. Their fear are well-trained, you know, ex-military, caught at their core, well-trained, well-armed, better than the police in some cases, uh, hard right militias. Um, not all of them are hard right, but the vast majority of them. This, is, this keeps, this keep, I'm told this keeps kind of police forces and, you know, civil, civil law agencies um, at, at, at wake at night because it is, has such a potential. And then you throw in every kind of redneck that has got a shotgun or, um, you know, an AK-47 style uh, automatic weapon. And, you know, it, it's a proper nightmare. I mean, this is the, this is the, America is really a powder keg when you look at it like that. So I think, you know, destabilization and obviously <laughs> Donald Trump isn't the most stable of elements in a critical situation. Um, and you begin to see that America is a country with vast problems. Um, you know, you look at even, even after an attack like this or similar attacks, you know, Obama, you know, if he put his head above the parapet to start talking about, you know, gun control, <laughs> peppered behind him, shot, he had to kind of duck back down. You know, it's, 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 this is a very difficult situation. And because of the way the American Constitution has been constituted in terms of the checks and balances to kind of stop oligarchies, which is what the founding fathers, you know, looked to the old Greek city-states and Athens and democracy to kind of work out how to stop history repeating itself. They have put those checks and balances in, but some of the amendments and some of those checks and balances have actually allowed the capture of that state, I think, by large corporations. And, and it's, it's caused a gridlock in, in politics. You know, you know, even if you have a kind of massively reforming Bernie Sanders type character, can you see how he could pioneer radical change to that country in a five or 10 year term through uh, Congress and the Senate? Uh, collectively. I, I struggle to see that. I don't see, America seems to be locked into a kind of, a, I'm not going to say a death spin, that sounds a little bit out of order, but America seems to be locked into a dark place and I can't see how it's going to get out of it. Um, and when you look at, you know, the armed camps and the militarization of the police, seems to be an internal arms war, an arms race going on and that, that can't be good. I don't want to over dramatize it. I don't want to like, you know, this yeah, is obviously not talked about enough, right? This, so. this, I don't think it is talked about enough. And you know, look, one of the problems that we have with Brexit, whatever happens with Brexit, there's a good chance in the next five to 10 years, our relationship with Europe is going to be weakened. That means, and that's what Atlanticists like Liam Fox want, we are gonna be pulled into the American orbit, an increasingly destable and violent American orbit. That's what some of them want. I don't, I happen to think that for all its faults, Europe is far better for us. It's our closest neighbor, trading and economically, but also civilly in terms of culture and our outlook on the world, about democracy, about our views about how the world should proceed, about climate change, about resource depletion. Europe is far closer to us. And what we do is we cut those ties with Europe. We end up gravitating, that's my fear, towards that country. And it's, it doesn't feel like it's heading to a great place. And that's what I think people need to think about. You know, and it's not just about trade deals. It's also us moving closer to them in terms of alliances, in terms of military operations and so on and so forth. We're close enough as it is. The further we move from Europe, the closer I think we end up moving towards America because the area of, you know, rural Britannia, United Kingdom kind of forging out, you know, what is it called? Empire 2.0. That went Daniel really, Hannah, that went down Daniel really Hannah well. Thing, right? That went down, yeah, that went um, down really well with um, uh, the Commonwealth. Um, I just don't think that's a starter. It's a, it's, it's, of course it's not a starter. So, you know, that's, that's my concern. Another one of my concerns. Kirsty, I'm going to finish with you. So we're talking about secession in Spain. Mm -hmm in the United Kingdom, briefly touched upon in the US. Historically speaking, it's been very successful. It's a republic which has endured for about 250 years. It's a lot longer than most places. Is it possible that in our lifetime we might see genuine secessionism in the US? Of the right or the left, right? If you're in California and you're a liberal and you work in Silicon Valley, you might want a California republic, I right? I mean, I, I think actually to look a little bit further, if you look at Puerto Rico, 
you all live in Puerto Rico and your president doesn't, you know, hasn't really said anything about you, doesn't give a damn about the fact that 80% of your country has gone. Um, I think you're going to start looking at smaller um, islands back in a way from the US rather than the actual, like, the federal states, like... Um, so some of the dependencies. The dependencies. Some of them will be underwater because yeah. of climate change, but... Really? On that happy note. <laughs> I, 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 very quickly, I would just say, you know, I think America's already had, well, had a war of so-called secession, the civil, the original civil war, which was probably one of the bloodiest wars in American history, bloodier than, I think, you know, the First World War and the Second World War in terms of the amount of death. But I think what you have to be remember very carefully is that it wasn't just a war of secession. In fact, that was... I, don't, I think there's been a lot of revisionism that's been going on. We're doing a lot of reading about this after the Charlottesville massacre and the demonstrations. Um, the, war, the Civil War of America was predominantly a war of slavery. And if you doubt that, go back and look at the secessionists, the so-called secessionists that were talking, and the issue was slavery. That's why they were seceding. Now, obviously, America doesn't have a slave issue, a slavery issue at the moment. And there could be a multitude of reasons why states would want to secede from the Union. I think it's very difficult, but I think what you would see, uh, again, is that the American state would not hesitate, I can't see it hesitating, to use uh, you know, the most extreme violence to stop a state from doing that. But who would? I mean, I mean if San Francisco, uh, I mean, sorry, but California, you know, you could think possible, but why? What would lead up to that? What would happen to that for that to happen? You could have said the same about Spain 10 years ago. I mean, the stats on in, uh, Catalans wanting independence in the mid-2000s were like 15, 16%, and now... We're seeing what we're seeing, so oh, yeah. who knows? Yeah. Anyway, anyway, Clive, you've been great. Thank you. Yeah? You leave oh, me I hanging. <laughs> I wanted a fist bump. Oh, yeah, go fist, on, fist, go fist, on, here fist, we go. go. There we go. <laughs> well, we've all survived uh, conference. I'm looking at the main camera, here we go. Uh, we've all survived conference. I've got flu. You're not feeling too great, you said? I'm off, I'm off the booze. I'm being healthy for the next two months. Had, it kills me. I had two boiled <laughs> eggs for breakfast. Clive feels great. He looks great. He's well rested. <clears throat> Clive looks like, you know, the, he looks younger than me. <laughs> and he's the MP. He was meant to be the stressed out one. So, yeah, uh, Michael Walker's sick. So we survived. Decent show. Long live socialism. The Tory conference. Let's have a real laugh over the next few days. We'll be back next Monday. See you then.